On About Books, we delve into the latest news about the publishing industry with interesting insider interviews with publishing industry experts. We'll also give you updates on current nonfiction authors and books, the latest book reviews, and we'll talk about the current nonfiction books featured on C-SPAN's Book TV. We assume you're here because you enjoy listening to C-SPAN's podcast. If you're a regular listener, please consider supporting our nonprofit operations so we can continue to bring you quality public affairs podcasts like these. Visit cspan.org slash donate to learn more. And welcome to About Books. Now, in a few minutes, we'll chat with a federal judge turned author whose debut book looks to the past to explain current U.S.-Russian relations. But first, here's some of the latest news from the publishing industry. The Associated Press reports that former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows is being sued by his publisher for contradicting his book's claims about the 2020 elections. Mr. Meadows wrote in his book, The Chief's Chief, that the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump. But All Seasons Press cited media reports on Mr. Meadows' sworn testimony that indicates he knew Mr. Trump had lost the election to Joe Biden. Now, according to the AP, All Seasons Press filed a breach of contract suit alleging that Mr. Meadows had damaged sales of the book as well as the publisher's reputation. Now, in other news, HarperCollins will publish a new book by Pope Francis. It will be called Life, My Story Through History. According to the publisher, Pope Francis said that the book would be the story of his life through the most important and dramatic events that humanity has experienced over the past 80 years. Now, among the events that the Pope explores, the outbreak of World War II, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the moon landing in 1969, and the 9-11 terrorist attacks in 2001. Quote, this book was written so that people, especially younger people, can listen to the voice of an elderly person and reflect on what our planet has experienced so as not to repeat the mistakes of the past. The book by Pope Francis is due out in the spring of 2024. And now an interview with author and U.S. District Court Judge Stephen Fryatt. Book TV's John McArdle sat down with the judge to discuss his debut book on Cold War history. Here it is. Author Stephen Fryatt, how does a U.S. District Court judge from Oklahoma end up writing a book about how Russians and Americans see each other and themselves on the world stage? Well, John, the, the book really ar ar arises from my personal experiences in Russia and in the United States with Russians. Uh, I, had, I did not have any extensive contact, and that's putting it mildly, with Russia or Russians before about 2006. But beginning in, in 2006, at the request of the chief judge of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, Robert Henry, uh, I hosted a Russian delegation here uh, under the Open World Program. And that, that uh, if you will, evolved into an invitation for me to uh, come to Russia, which I did in, in 2007. Uh, that was the first of 15 trips that I have taken to Russia. Uh, and uh, I, I must say that uh, as, as my experience uh, evolved uh, here with, with the Russian delegations that I hosted here and my contact with uh, lawyers, judges, law students, and other people in Russia, uh, I realized that uh, uh, there is uh, perhaps uh, a, a lesson to be learned and consequently a book to be written uh, that uh, helps to explain uh, why and help people understand why Russians think about Americans the way they do and why Americans think about Russians the way they do. And that really, that all grew out of that uh, that experience. Uh, all told, I've spent about a half a year of my life in Russia since uh, 2007, and they have been some of the most satisfying and enriching experiences of my life. Sadly, now, obviously, uh, with the regime in the Kremlin, uh, the relationship in many ways has been turned on its head. We don't know how long it's going to be before things even have any remote resemblance to normal. But uh, the experiences that I had uh, led to the book that I wrote, 
uh, and as you probably noticed, the book does conf it does conform or address the post February 2022 status of things. And I think there are uh, continuing lessons to be learned about how Russians think about us and how, about how we think about Russians. And it's a, a book that begins with a William Faulkner quote in the preface. Uh, it's from Requiem for a Nun. The past is never dead. It's not even past. What was William Faulkner telling us? What are you telling us with that quote? <clears throat> well, uh, Faulkner's quote, I, I don't, I won't pretend to uh, know exactly what Faulkner had in mind, but what I had in mind when I picked up that quote is that uh, in in both countries, but I, I dare say particularly and especially in Russia, the thousand years of history uh, of that country since late in the first millennium weighs heavily, uh, even, even if subconsciously, on the way Russians think about themselves and about their place in the world and frankly about the threats that that they uh, that they perceive internationally and for that reason i thought it was appropriate to uh, to highlight that that theme uh by using that that uh somewhat cryptic quote uh, uh, from from faulkner I, I think it it fit quite well because the past really does influence day to day perhaps more so in russia than in the united states the way that, that our uh, our counterparts in Russia think about themselves, their country, and the threats that they perceive. So uh, plenty of uh, historical reference here, references here and, and literary references as you talk about historical memory. One of those uh, is Tolstoy's War and Peace. And what does that tell us about how Russians view themselves on the world stage? Uh, there is, and you can get this out of War and Peace, uh, and, and obviously it's an epic novel, uh, and I think it's a it's a novel that uh, a historical novel that uh, is a really a beginning point for anyone who wants to understand Russia and Russian history. Uh, War and Peace uh, tells us about Russians that struggle, and, and particularly international struggle. Uh, is part of life for a country. Uh, Russia is the most invaded country in the history of the world. That's not to excuse anything that the that the Kremlin regime has been doing. I, I hasten to add, uh, but the uh, the sensitivity in Russia to its vulnerability to invasion from every direction except the north. Uh, the the uh, the inbred. Uh, willingness of Russians to withstand horrendous hardship for the benefit of the motherland. Uh, the inbred perseverance that the Russian people have, their, their willingness to tolerate uh, incredible hardship, are all things that you can get out of a book like War and Peace, uh, as well as some sense of Russians, uh, a sense of isolation within their own uh, uh, country. and. Uh, those are things that you get out of uh, books like uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace or Dostoevsky's uh, work or Chekhov or Gorky uh, or Pushkin. And uh, those are all very much in the mix in terms of uh, uh, our what it takes for us to understand not only Russian history as a rote subject, but the Russian people, the way they think today about themselves and their position in the world. And the other part of your book, Judge Wright, is looking about how Americans view themselves in the world and, and literary references there as well. This from one of the early chapters of your book. You write, on the long flight home from one of my early trips to Russia, I found myself wondering how the people of the two nations could be so much alike in so many ways, yet in other ways so different. Searching rather randomly for clues to this mystery, I picked up my copy of the Federalist Papers and read that incomparable collection of essays again that helped. What did you discover there again? That, uh, my, my rereading of the Federalist Papers reminded me that we in the, in the, in the if you will, the Anglo-American West have had experiences that uh, Russia and the Russian people missed, frankly. Uh, they missed what we uh, generically call the, <clears throat> the Enlightenment. Uh, they, they missed 
um, for, for decades, much of the Industrial Revolution with its uh, beneficial consequences in, in what we call the Anglo-American West. Uh, they missed the Reformation. Uh, and uh, the things that are woven into our culture, for instance, starting with the Magna Carta uh, uh, in the year 1215, and other uh, other principles uh, that that now add up to, if you will, the the liberal democratic order that we that we enjoy, uh, were missed uh, in Russia. Uh, now, starting in the uh, in the 1860s with with Tsar Alexander the uh, first, or that would be Alexander the uh, second, <clears throat> there were some serious attempts to modernize. Uh, Russian society and to, if you will, liberalize Russian society, such as the institution of, of the right of trial by a jury. But uh, still, uh, the reason that I referred to the, the Federalist Papers in that context was to uh, articulate my understanding of why, uh, even though we seem so similar uh, in so many ways, there are still historical differences that have consequences to this day and every day. In terms of, of where we're going, one other quote from your book, uh, you take a look uh, back to Alexis de Tocqueville and uh, Democracy in America, 1835. There are today two great peoples on earth who though they started from different points seem to be advancing towards the same goal, the Russians and the Anglo-Americans. What is that goal in 2023? Uh, from from the uh, from the cynical American uh, standpoint, we we may look at it as a a Russian desire to uh, dominate their desired sphere of influence. Uh, Russia makes no bones about uh, having a privileged uh, sphere of influence. From the cynical Russian standpoint, they probably view the uh, United States uh, in a mirror image fashion. Uh, viewing the United States as likewise having, uh, attempting to have not only a hemispheric, but a worldwide sphere of influence. Uh, uh, de Tocqueville, uh, remarkably, for having written about a third of the way into the 19th century, remarkably, de Tocqueville recognized those trends. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine uh, goes back to the 1820s, but it had not really developed in a way that would suggest uh, a desire for a worldwide sphere of influence. A and in the 1820s, certainly Russia uh, was not conducting its international uh, relations in such a way that would suggest uh, anything broader than simply defending itself. But de Tocqueville recognized that one day these two civilizations may be in tension with each other geopolitically. And I thought that was a rather remarkable thing uh, for, uh, for an individual to write 200 years ago, or nearly 200 years ago. And this book uh, that you've written, Containing History, How Cold War History Explains U.S.-Russia Relations, uh, how did you write it around your work as, as the, the senior district, ju district court judge for the Western District of Oklahoma? Uh, probably a pretty busy schedule week to week for you? Well, uh, that's what nights and weekends uh, <laughs> are for. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, my, my, my official duties uh, certainly take up my time all day. And sometimes they take up my time well, when I'm staring at the ceiling in bed in the middle of the night as well. I'll acknowledge that. But uh, in terms of my work on the book, it, it, uh, it really uh, was a nice break, if you will, from my judicial duties in the sense that uh, it was essentially unrelated to my judicial duties. I, it gave me an opportunity to research, to uh, to read history, and to write. And uh, the direct answer to your question is that uh, I have a nice office at home, uh, and I have a summer home as well that, that uh, has a, a, a very uh, adequate office in it. And that's where I did most of the work. And it, it was really a refreshing break from the day-to-day -day repetition of my judicial duties. Appointed by George W. Bush in 2001 to the bench, uh, went to the University of Oklahoma for undergrad and law school. Uh, this book published by the University of Oklahoma Press. Uh, are you doing a, a book tour? And when you're on a book tour, do you prefer the title author or judge? 
Uh, well, I'm, uh, when I'm out, when I'm, I'm talking about my book, I, I prefer the the author hat. Uh, now, the fact that I'm a judge is is part of the story, I suppose. Uh, but we have had some book launch events uh, in which uh, I really uh, present myself uh, much more as an author than as a judge, and uh, I, and I think that uh, plays into what the book is all about because. Uh, save uh, for one chapter on the, on the U.S. Supreme Court's treatment of communism, the book really uh, fairly well stays away from uh, uh, legal and uh, judicial issues. And, and what are the rules about that, especially in, in that chapter where you, where you delve into uh, your day job, if you will, the, the judiciary? What rules do you have to follow when you're writing about it? And what rules did you have to follow when publishing this book? Well, the, the the fundamental rule is that I that I should not expound out of court on an issue that's likely to come before me as a judge, and that chapter on uh, entitled "Communism and the U.S. Supreme Court" deals with Smith Act uh, prosecutions in the 1950s and early 60s, and those matters have now been settled for decades. So. Uh, it was really uh, with a, a joyful uh, frame of mind that I did uh, that legal historical research, uh, and I was very comfortable that I was dealing with issues that were, to put it mildly, extremely unlikely to come before me in my judicial capacity. That was that's really the only ground rule. Beyond beyond that, I had I had what I call the joy of of researching that facet of of legal history and commenting on it. With legal opinions becoming sometimes historical documents, uh, whether they're celebrated or, or reviled, uh, when you're writing a, a legal opinion as a as a judge, how much time do you spend on on the prose of that opinion? Once you've formed that opinion, how much does the author side of you come up and want to make that something that's readable for the public? Uh, in my in my opinion, uh, that's that's really a pretty important facet of our written product. It has to be understandable to the parties and their counsel. Uh, and this, it also, I think it's especially important for it to be understandable, understandable to the unsuccessful party. And then to the extent that uh, what I do as a district judge may be referred to by other judges, uh, it also needs to uh, very clearly state the factual context in which the dispute arises and what, uh, which facts are the decisive facts, uh, which facts are uh, considered to be irrelevant, and how I apply the, the law to those facts. So uh, uh, in, even in routine orders, I try especially hard to uh, make it very clear both to the parties and the counsel and perhaps to any wider audience that there may ultimately be uh, the basis for the, the ruling. And I try to avoid what we would generically call legalese. I don't think that contributes to understanding of our written product at all. How do you feel, and, and some of your rulings have, have gotten attention uh, in Oklahoma, specifically on, on vaccine mandates in particular, how do you feel when, when the media cites your ruling and quotes just a few sentences of your ruling? Are you okay with them pulling out a couple sentences of your ruling? Would you prefer people to read the whole thing, the the media treatment of of your views on law. Uh, in general, the reporters that cover our work are able to, uh, even though they nece necessarily have to s select what it is they want to quote. In general, the reporters that cover our work are good at presenting a fair uh, account of of uh, our rulings. Uh, and it it's it's just goes with the territory that there will be snippets quoted from from our written product from our orders and opinions, and uh, it's it's not realistic to expect that the general public will read what we write in its entirety, with very rare exceptions, perhaps in that vaccine case. Uh, but uh, I, I think I can say safely that on the whole, we are fortunate here in our court at least to have coverage uh, both locally and, and nationally in some cases that uh, fairly extracts from our written orders and opinions those parts that uh, in a balanced way will help inform the public as to what we did and why we did it. 
And how much training does a judge get on being a, a good writer? Do your colleagues come to you for, for tips on kind of that prose part once the opinion is formed? Uh, I don't, I, I certainly don't recall much interaction be, uh, between myself and my colleagues on the nuts and bolts of, of writing. By the time you get to be a federal district judge, let alone a circuit judge, uh, you have done a lot of legal writing and the, the quality of your legal writing will have made, we would hope, a favorable impression on those who might be in a position to consider you uh, for judicial service. So there's not very much interaction among us in terms of tips on legal writing, but I will say uh, when necessary, and it, this is uh, uh, perhaps uh, more often than you might think, we do read each other's work. And I have certainly learned uh, from uh, the writing style of my colleagues uh, by reading their work uh, uh, as distinguished from discussing uh, writing techniques with them. Would you care to name a few whose, uh, whose work you particularly enjoy reading? Well, uh, Judge Robert Henry is a very lucid writer. I have enjoyed, he's now retired from the Tenth Circuit, but uh, he's a very lucid writer. Uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch of the Supreme Court is a former Tenth Circuit judge, and he has a very uh, conversational more or less folksy style of writing, even as a justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. That carries over from his time on the Tenth Circuit. And I, to my perception, that uh, uh, that tendency by Justice Gorsuch to, to use more contractions, for instance, uh, has has had an, an influence on the writing of other judges. We, uh, It has tended to, I think, to make us a little bit less stilted because after all, if, if, if a justice of the Supreme Court can write in a conversational folksy way, then why can't we? And is that what you go for, that, that folksy way? And I'm specifically remembering back to the vaccine mandate case, you talk about deciding it on both the legal opinions, but the common sense, and that they both pointed to the same decision. Uh, as I recall, in, in, that, in that opinion, I, I probably, actually shied away from uh, anything that could be considered to be folksy because the issue was of such grave importance to both sides. Uh, I tried to be uh, crystal clear in, in my ruling, and I tried to uh, uh, give some historical backdrop uh, to the reasons for my ruling. Uh, I, but uh, the flip side of that is that I also tried to avoid uh, this uh, this virus that we call legal ease in my writing, and and I try to accomplish that in everything that I write. And then, for folks who aren't familiar with that ruling, can you quickly summarize it? Well, that was a ruling in which uh, I concluded that the uh, the federal uh, vaccine mandate for members of our armed forces does also apply to members of the National Guard. Uh, in the 50 states of the Union, uh, the National Guard in some ways does enjoy a distinct legal status as opposed to what we generically call the regular Army or the regular Air Force. Uh, but there are, all, are also some overriding legal propositions embedded in federal law that uh, in that case, I concluded, uh, rendered the National Guard subject to the uh, nationwide mandate on vaccination for members of our military. And then Judge Fry, I, I guess finally, bring it back to, to the book containing history, how Cold War history explains U.S.-Russia relations. Uh, how hard was it to, to write this book versus those opinions that you write day to day or, or week to week in your day job? Uh, it was very different, of course. Uh, and I tried, I also tried to avoid legal writing in the book, uh, but I would say because it was a joy to do the research and writing, it was really not hard, it was relaxing. It gave me a, a bit of an outlet, if you will, a bit of a break from day-to-day uh, -day judicial duties. And uh, so I would not apply the word hard. Now, tragically, uh, after February 24th of 2022, some parts of the of the final version of the manuscript were hard to write because of Putin's tragic assault on Ukraine. 
but uh, that, I, that, that, that was hard writing to do in a different sense. The, the task of researching and writing the book was really a joy. And do you think you have a second book in you? Well, the, the University of Oklahoma Press editor has made some references to that. But I must say, my, my darling grandkids are pretty stiff competition. <laughs> Judge Stephen Fryatt is also author Stephen Fryatt. The book containing history, how Cold War history explains U.S.-Russia relations. Thanks for the time on Book TV. John, it's been my pleasure. It's been my pleasure to be with you. And you're watching About Books, a program and podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. Well, each week, dozens of new books are published. Here's a sampling. In Founding Partisans, historian H.W. Brands discusses the political differences between founders Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams. Fox News host and best-selling author Brian Kilmeade takes a look at the friendship of Theodore Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington. His book, Teddy and Booker, How Two American Icons Blazed a Path for Racial Equality. And Pulitzer Prize winning poet and author Tracy K. Smith is out with a memoir about black life and black community. The book is entitled To Free the Captives, A Plea for the American Soul. Also each week, new book reviews are published. Here are three. In the Washington Times, History As It Happens podcast host Martin DeCaro reviews a new offering by Stuart Reed who is executive editor of Foreign Affairs Magazine. Mr. Reed's book is entitled The Lumumba Plot, and it details the U.S. sanctioned plot to assassinate the leader of the newly independent Democratic Republic of Congo in 1960. Quote, in his page-turning narrative history, Stuart Reed tells the story of Patrice Lumumba's meteoric rise and tragic demise at a critical Cold War juncture. That's Martin DeCaro writing. The strength of the Lumumba plot lies in Mr. Reed's treatment of President Eisenhower and the CIA's culpability in this largely forgotten coup d'etat. And in the New York Times recently, John Lennon reviewed author Ben Austin's correction, parole, prison, and the possibility of change. Now, Mr. Lennon is a contributing writer at Esquire and he is currently serving a 28 years to life sentence. He's up for parole himself in 2029. This is what he wrote in his review. It's clear that Austin sees plenty wrong with our system of corrections, but he doesn't whine with advocacy. His style is informative with little sap, and he manages to make sympathetic characters out of violent men. He explains our world, its codes of conduct, and how we adapt, and sometimes unravel as we try to survive. And finally, in the Tampa Bay Times, book critic Colette Bancroft took a look at Kara Fitzpatrick's The Death of Public Schools, How Conservatives Won the War Over Education in America. Ms. Bancroft calls the book, quote, engagingly written and even-handed. If you've ever looked at the current state of public education and wondered how we got here, this book is a clear roadmap. And one additional note, Kara Fitzpatrick was a recent guest on Book TV's Afterwards program. You can watch the full interview online at booktv.org. Well, this week on Afterwards, the guest is Greg Lukianoff. He is the author of The Canceling of the American Mind, and in it, he argues that the right to free speech is being threatened by cancel culture. Here's a preview. I couldn't believe that I was still seeing people really staking their entire reputations on the idea that cancel culture was a hoax or didn't even happen. And I can tell you from working on campuses this long, it didn't just happen. It's the kind of thing they're gonna be studying in 50 to 100 years, just <laughs> like we study the Red Scare today. So I was finally like, okay, that's it. I've had it. Like, I'm gonna put this all in one book. I'm gonna make three, three primary points. One, cancel culture is real. It's happening on, uh, on a uh, historic scale. And by the way, we take on both left and right, which is very important to, to a lot of people. Uh, the, the middle part is basically about 
reconceptualizing how you think about cancel culture, to think about it as only the most extreme way of winning arguments without winning arguments. That essentially, rather than persuade somebody, we, we've learned this very junior high school-like tactic, which, by the way, I, I argue that it does in some ways come from junior high school, but I can get into that later, um, to uh, just scare people out of disagreeing with you or ruin their lives if they do. And the third part um, is us uh, beginning the process of trying to find a way out of this madness um, and trying to really make people understand that cancel culture isn't just about the, you know, the, the more than a thousand professors who have been targeted, for example. It's about what it does to trust and expertise. Because if you see that, for example, Carol Hooven at Harvard, who uh, was uh, started to be forced out by a, uh, initially by a DEI administrator, for going on Fox News to talk about her book, and she said, uh, she made the point that we should be kind to transgender people, we should be, um, uh, we, uh, we should use their pronouns, uh, but as the author of a book on testosterone and an evolutionary biologist, we have to recognize that biological sex is real and it matters scientifically. And that led to a whole campaign against her at, uh, at Harvard. Now, and she, she got extremely depressed and she's now leaving Harvard. Now, that's sad, all by itself, that's, ca that's cancel culture, that's illiberal, all by itself. But what does that do to people's faith and expertise on this topic? Because uh, the, the public isn't stupid. And looking at a situation where like, even at Harvard, someone's making you know, a very modest point that nobody disagreed with up until very recently, can be f for targeted and forced out of their job. Um, why should I believe anybody on this topic anymore? Because I now know that to, to say anything other than the approved line can get you canceled even at Harvard. So I, I think people really need to get that cancel culture is much more devastating to our shared world of facts than people understand. And a reminder that Afterwards airs every Sunday evening at 10 p.m. Eastern Time on Book TV. Well, thanks for joining us for About Books, a program and podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. We'll continue to bring you new author programs and publishing news each week. And a reminder that you can get this podcast on our C-SPAN Now app, and you can watch all Book TV programs at booktv.org.